coming up on today's message with Pastor Johnny. I tell you that if these should keep silent, if they don't open their mouths, if they sit like a bump on a log, if they turn the other way and say that ain't my business, if they keep quiet and keep it moving, claiming that they minding their own, if they keep silent, the rocks will cry out. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for every good and perfect gift that comes from above. From the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, your name is excellent in all the earth. Lord God, we ask that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Hide me behind your cross. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. For the time that is ours to share together, I want to talk a little bit about Palm Monday. Palm Monday. I said Monday. That, that is absolutely correct. Mondays are interesting, particularly if you work at a church, right? Because Mondays are supposed to be your day off. Uh, many, many a church I worked at, the office would be closed on Mondays because the office was usually open on Saturdays and Sundays, and they would allow Mondays to have that time off, and I didn't learn that until I started working at a church on staff. I wasn't even in a pastor position. I was working as an audio-visual engineer, and I learned that if you wanted something done on Monday, you was probably going to have to have it done some other day, because Monday was the day after a big day least when it came to worship. Monday has kind of gotten a bad rap, even in the working world, the corporate world, right? Because you spend all this time working hard Monday through Friday, and then uh, you get the good weekend going, and just as the weekend is hitting peak enjoyment, come back to Mondays. Palm Monday. I understand that this is Palm Sunday today. But given that Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem riding on a colt happened about 2,000 years ago, how do we actually know it happened on a Sunday? One might assume that the Gospels tell us so, but they really don't. We have one single clue. Uh, it's in the gospel according to John, and that comes from putting events in two verses together. John 12 and 1 says, six days before Passover, Jesus came to Bethany to the home of Lazarus. And then 12, 12 says, the next day, Jesus came into Jerusalem. The thing is, is that the Passover is really calculated by a Hebrew calendar, which is not the same as our 12-month Gregorian calendar that we're used to. So... The start of Passover doesn't move based on that 12-month calendar, and that's how it ends up being different days of the year on the calendar that we use. And so if that doesn't move, but our calendar moves, uh, it's always the same date depending on that. It could have been any day of the week depending on what year the crucifixion took place. Uh, so to say that, Jew, that Jesus entered Jerusalem on a Sunday is largely a tradition based on the assumption about the year that Jesus died, some say 30 A.D. And the fact that all four Gospels agree that his crucifixion took place on the Friday of that week, we call Good Friday uh, if you're taking notes at home, Matthew 27, 62, Mark 15, 42, Luke 23, 54, and John 19, 31. But let's not get burdened with the details. I was just putting it out there to get your attention. 
some biblical scholars have suggested, though, that the procession into Jerusalem took place on a Monday. But I would submit to you that it doesn't matter what day it really took place. Except from the perspective of the people that rejoiced when Jesus rode into the city. Uh, If it was Monday, it's a weekday, not the Sabbath, which for Hebrews during the biblical time was from Friday sundown to Saturday. And it was certainly not a holy day in the religious sense of the term. But if it was Sunday, it's still not a holy day or a religious day to them uh, like Sunday is for us. Sunday to them would have been like our Monday, the day after something happened. Uh, The first day of the work week, the day after the Sabbath rest, time to get the sweeping together, open up the shop, wash the clothes, go to the market, repair the ox cart, get the bread in the oven, deal with matters left over from the previous week that had been put aside for the Sabbath and so forth. Besides The Passover was in a few days, so it would have been a pretty busy day if it was a Sunday. So regardless of the actual day of the week, for the people who greeted Jesus as he rode into the city, it was kind of like we treat a Monday. Uh, uh, For us, there's a sense in which Mondays are the first day of the work week, and they symbolize the business of continuing, of resuming after a brief weekend, a Sabbath pause, Life going on, things getting back to normal, things getting back to routine. Uh, Many people kind of find it hard to drag themselves to work on Mondays. It's such a trial and tribulation. The very effort to survive Mondays has become the subject of numerous songs. Many in the, the gospel theologian blues tradition... Recorded by those like T-Bone Walker and B.B. King, Eric Clapton, and and the the Mississippi uh, Mississippi John Hurt and Muddy Waters. Rainy days and Mondays always get me down, sang the Carpenters. Uh, Monday, Monday, can't trust that day, the mamas and the papas. But for many people, particularly with those type A aggressive personalities, Mondays are a pleasure. A day to attack what needs to be done and a day to jump back in with both feet and make some things happen. I see a bunch of head nodding. I already knew this church was full of a bunch of type A personalities. (laughs) This just confirmed it. (laughs) Amen. And so there was this time to get things started. There is a parade for Jesus There's a preparation. Let the church say preparation. Preparation. Uh, Jesus is coming down from the Mount Olivet, and there is preparation, preparation, a noun, the action or process of making ready, uh, being made ready for use or consideration, and something done to get ready for an event or an undertaking. Jesus was preparing with this triumphant entry to do what he had come to do. Uh, And there were men and there were men on a mission. Uh, These men on a mission were instructed by Jesus. Jesus instructed these two disciples and they had orders. They were to fetch from a nearby village a colt for the Savior to ride on. A colt fit for a king. Uh, 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 (laughs) The gospel according to Luke doesn't tell us whether or not it was a donkey or a horse. Uh, Both Mark and John both say donkey. And either translation for me is fine, because as I learned in seminary, as I learned in seminary taking all Old Testament courses, that either a donkey or a horse was fit for a king. Uh, Not for anybody in this room, but, you know, just, just. In future conversation, but not for anybody in this room, but uh, for those who often get mad at the preacher for driving a nice car. And they say Jesus rode a donkey. So that should be good enough for the preacher. 
allow me to exegete some text. Ah, if we turned in our Bibles to Zechariah 9 and 9, we would learn that King Zechariah uh, rode a donkey. The kings rode donkeys. They rode donkeys in times of peace and horses in times of war. The kings rode there. Everybody didn't have a donkey to ride on when people were riding donkeys. That's why it was a great undertaking of faith for the people, uh, the disciples that Jesus uh, told to go get a cult and bring it and say that the Lord needs of it. Because that would have been just like walking down to McCree Ford or Gay Auto or uh, Tom uh, uh, McCall, Sterling McCall, Toyota or any other car place around here and just walking off the lot with the car. And when they say, hey, what are you doing? The Lord needs of it. <laughs> and actually getting off the lot with it. This was a great undertaking of faith. And so Zechariah 9 and 9 talks about it and, 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 and they're fit for a king. And then you could go to 1 Kings 1, 32 through 35. There was a dispute about who was supposed to be the next king of Israel after, uh, after uh, David. And it was supposed to be Solomon, but one of the other sons thought that it was their turn to be king. And so David got Nathan the prophet, Zadok the priest, and the commander of the army, Benaiah, to come place Solomon on an animal and march him into town. So just in case you had some confusion about who was supposed to be the next king, they were letting you know, look at this one marching into town on an island. Kings rode on these animals. Uh, we still got some more. We could go to Second Kings, J, uh, nine, chapter nine, verses six through thirteen. Jehu was another king where they had a parade to let everybody know that he was a king, and and they were being uh, they were he was anointed king of Israel, and so people put the cloaks down on before him to let him know that this was the king coming through. So they had the orders to go get a donkey, a colt, and they obeyed those orders. But just, in, just to clarify it over and over again in the Bible, when you saw somebody riding into town on an animal, they were letting you know that their king was here. And so when Jesus was coming into Jerusalem riding on a colt and everybody was putting their cloaks down on the ground in front of them, that was to let you know that not only was your king here, but the king of kings was here. The Lord of lords was here. The one who was and is and is to come. He was here and he was letting everybody know what was going on. And so they had their orders. The orders were part of this preparation, and the response to the orders was obedience. Uh, if you do exactly as Jesus instructed, they did it. What they did exactly, rather, as Jesus had instructed. If you want what God has for you, you need to do what God says for you to do. If you don't want what God has for you, then don't do what God said for you to do. If there was only some way I could find out what God had for me. If there was only some way I could figure out what God wanted for me. Because I would learn if I figured out what God had for me that I am the righteousness of God. If I understood that I would understand that I am above and not beneath. I would understand that I am the apple of his eye. I would understand that he knows exactly how many hairs I have on my head. He calls me friend. If I understood what was happening I know that I was blessed when I came and when I go. And that I could do all things through Jesus Christ who gave me strength. But what I want to do is I got to do what God says. Amen. If you always say what God never said, you'll always get what God never intended for you to have. Uh, and so they, there was preparation. And so we move from preparation to celebration. Let the church say celebration. celebration. Uh, the, the crowd prepared his path. The crowd prepared his path, and the crowd not only prepared his path, they proclaimed his praise. Uh, the flashback, even though we read uh, for your hearing Luke chapter 19, it talked about them proclaiming his praise all the way back in Luke chapter 2, verses 13 through 15, where it said, And suddenly there was an angel 
uh, with, there was with an angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God, saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on, all, and on earth peace, goodwill towards men. And so it was, the angels had gone away from them into heaven, and the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem to see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known from us. God deserves our praise. They've been praising since the beginning, and they're praising now. Ah, yes, so we go from that preparation to celebration. When I look back over my own life, I don't know about anybody else. I could just talk about myself. But when I look back over my own life, I understand that if it had not been for the Lord on my side, where would I be? Ah, yes, and so there's celebration. And anytime there's celebration, anytime there's some sort of public outcry, anytime there's some sort of jubilant uh, excitement about something, there's going to go from celebration to denunciation. Let the church say denunciation. Uh, The Pharisees tried to rebuke him. They, they, They said, teacher, rebuke your followers for saying things like that. It don't take all that. Tell them to shut up. Tell them to stop talking about this Hosanna Tell them to stop talking about this blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Tell them to stop all that noise. They had a problem not only with Jesus being called the Messiah, his elevation, but they also had a problem with anything that could have provoked Roman intervention. We got a good thing going on right now. We don't need you messing it up. Running around here talking about you king of kings and Jesus is Lord. No, everybody around here is saying Caesar is Lord. Everybody around here is saying Caesar is king of kings and Lord of lords. And I've got me a little position in this messed up hierarchy. I want to keep it. Don't come out here talking about this Messiah, this savior, this king. Don't you know Caesar come and wipe all of this up? There's some history around it as well. You look at, uh, in your own study time, you know, because this ain't the only time we're supposed to be reading the Bible on Sunday for an hour and a half a week. In your own study time, uh, I would would suggest in your own study time, you look up somebody by the name of Judas Maccabeus. A couple hundred years before Jesus was walking, this man came in, defeated the Roman army for a whole week, pushed them back until they called for reinforcements. And he came riding in. And they put palms down for him. But then the Romans called reinforcements. Kind of like you punching a bully one good time. And they, oh, that was good. Mm." And then they punch you back even harder. So they had seen this before, and they were looking for some sort of militaristic saving. But Jesus came to save their souls. And so they were scared, not only that Jesus was calling himself the Messiah, but they were scared about potential Roman intervention. The more visible you become, the more problems the enemy will try to expose you to. People have a real problem. We like you, people in general like you rather when you're at one particular level. But, but try to outperform them on the job. Let, let, let your kid do a little better in school than theirs. Let, let, let you get a little raise or a promotion. You'll find out who some of your friends really are. Let you get elected to a position of leadership in the church and they don't. Stepping on toes today. I ain't stepped on toes for a while. I'm going to step on some today. We like you where you're at. We don't want you to grow and get any better. And so they'll put things in place, and then they'll, when you get way too big for your bridges, they'll really try to shut you down. Uh, some thought that Martin Luther King got too big for his britches. It was cool as long as he was talking about uh, uh, peace and and nonviolence, and when he started talking about some economic empowerment, Medgar Evers 
was fighting for poor, for poor people in Mississippi. You can't mess up this balance we got. We like these people poor. Nelson Mandela took a stance against apartheid in South Africa, and that got him 27 years in prison, standing up for other people, messing up the system, messing up the things the way we like them can get you in some trouble. They didn't want all of this attention being drawn to a system that they had figured out how to work on. But the Savior's reply was, if they keep quiet, I tell you that if these should keep silent, if they don't open their mouths, if they sit like a bump on a log, If they turn the other way and say that ain't my business, if they keep quiet and keep it moving, claiming that they minding their own, if they keep silent, the rocks will cry out. Sunlight is the greatest disinfectant. Uh, We are forced to address situations that are raised by whistleblowers, whether they're employees or insiders, who those who employees or insiders who become aware of wrongdoing or dangerous practices within a corporation, an agency, or even the church. When you make that information public, it's stopped. My mama always told me that the squeaky wheel gets the oil. We ought not be quiet, ought not ignore those things. There are protesters who have put themselves in legal jeopardy or risk physical violence to say something isn't right or fair or for the common good or pleasing God. We ought to be able to open our mouths for the bad and the good. When we see something that is good, we ought to say something. When we see something is bad, we ought to say something. We ought to be able to, if you see something, say something. We ought to be able to open up our mouths and talk. He said, if they don't praise me, the rocks will cry out. I don't want no rocks crying out for me. The Bible says in Isaiah 55, 6 and 7 to seek the Lord while he may be found and call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return to the Lord where he will have mercy upon him and on our God for he will, for the, he will abundantly pardon. You better call him. Uh, Psalm 50 and 15 says, and call on me in my, and call upon me in the day of trouble and I will deliver thee and thou shalt glorify me. Psalm 91 and 15 says, he shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in the trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. Philippians 4, 6 through 7 says, to be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Romans 10, 12 through 13 he says there is no distinction between Jew and Greek for the same Lord that is over all to call upon him for whoever not some people whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved won't he make a way for you won't he open doors for you did he wake you up this morning did he put food on your table and clothes on your back and a roof over your head and in your right mind He said he's done too much for me to turn back now. He's done too much for me to keep quiet about it. Hosanna, save now. I see my soon coming king. I'm going to praise him. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the doors of the church are open and we invite you to come. Thank you for listening to this message. Be sure to subscribe to us on YouTube, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or wherever you found this message. If this message blessed you, be a blessing to someone else and share it. Connect with Pastor Johnny on Instagram and Twitter 
And be sure to like Faith UMC Dickinson on Facebook.